Hi, my name is Tom Heffel, and this channel is all about helping students learn chemistry. In this video, we're going to be talking about the duality of matter. More specifically, kind of how every piece of matter acts as a particle and a wavelength, and we have this equation for wavelength. Okay? Now, this equation is wavelength is equal to Planck's constant over mass times velocity. And mass times velocity in physics is also known as momentum. So basically, if we have the mass and the velocity or momentum of an object, that that object would also have a wavelength based on this idea that all matter is like a particle and a wave. So therefore, every particle out there that's moving okay, has a wavelength. And there's a few things that we can learn about this equation beyond just wavelength. And uh, really kind of understanding the unit, the joule, is kind of uh, at the heart of this particular lesson. So let's get right into a, a particular problem. Let's say I have the mass and the velocity of an object. Of course, Planck's constant is a constant. And then we should be able to calculate the wavelength from that. So let's say we had an object that had a mass of 45 grams and a velocity of 15 meters per second. Now, a lot of students said, oh, this is really easy. We just plug and chug. And when they do, they'll get the wrong answer. Okay? And I want to talk about why that is, because that's really the heart of the lesson. Okay, So Planck's constant is a constant. Uh, you get this off the AP equation sheet if you're taking AP chemistry. Um, if you are in college, this might be a number you might have to memorize, or your professor might ask you to bring a note card with all your notes on it, and Planck's constant would be definitely something that you'd want on your note card. Um, but it's equal to <clears throat> 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Okay, So it has two units. As an energy unit, the joule, followed by a time unit, the second. Okay, and if we took our mass, which is uh, 45 grams, and our velocity, which is 15 uh, meters per second, and we work this out, we're going to get this number of 9.82 times 10 to the negative 37. But here's the problem, okay? 9.82 times 10 to the negative 37 watt, okay? Because when I look at these units, okay, nothing really cancels out, not even the seconds, because this is seconds, and in the denominator, it's in the denominator, so we call that a per second, like meters per second. So seconds don't even cancel out a per second. And you're like, well, I know wavelength should probably end up with a meter, Here's a meter, but that's in the denominator. You look at this, and you have all this what we call unit inconsistency. And for a lot of beginners in chemistry, they don't realize that these problems can have this inconsistency. They are so used to having problems where all the units just magically work out. you got these nice little problems within the gift with a nice little bow, and everything's just perfect, and all the units just work out. But when you get to the level of chemistry, high school chemistry, and then high school physics, and of course, if you're taking accelerated courses, this could be like an introductory college class chemistry or physics, you realize you really have to pay attention to your units, okay? And more specifically, <clears throat> we're going to concentrate in on what is a joule exactly, because most people don't know that a joule is just made up of a whole bunch of other units, okay? And I want to talk about those units. So a joule is equal to a kilogram times meter squared over second squared. And if you don't know that, you know, it, it probably doesn't surprise me. But in chemistry and in physics, you're going to have to know what these units are actually made up of. And you have to know, like, what a newton is made up of, okay, when you get to physics, okay? So this is just kind of like the beginning of where you start to get unit inconsist inconsistency, okay? So what I'm going to kind of come back to is maybe some things that you learned in freshman science or a previous science class, maybe from eighth grade or seventh grade. 
Uh, there's these equations called kinetic energy that you may have used before. And kinetic energy is one half times mass velocity squared. And so I'm going to go off on a sidebar here a little bit on kinetic energy, and then I'm going to come back to the problem. But if we were solving for kinetic energy, a lot of times students will just, oh, I'll just plug in the mass and the velocity, and I'll automatically get this joule unit, and they just have it memorized, but they don't understand where it comes from. Well, it comes from the mass being in kilograms, and then the velocity being meters per second, but remember you're squaring that. So when I work all this out, this squared comes here and here. So you end up getting kilograms times meters squared all over second squared. And that's just what I told you a joule is equal to. So I know you have some past experiences, maybe with the kinetic energy equation. And I just want to show you kind of like how those units would make up the joule. This also happens with potential energy. Not sure if you have some experience with potential energy, but it usually happens uh, at a young age, middle school, maybe freshman, sophomore year. But uh, the potential energy is based on you know, how high off the ground the object is, right? And so it's a combination of mass, gravity, and height, okay? Well, your mass is in kilograms. Your gravity is a type of acceleration, which is meters per second squared. And then your height is a meter. And what we're going to do is we're just going to combine these units again. And in the end, you're going to get kilograms times meters times meter, or meters squared, as your numerator. And then second squared is going to be in your denominator. So once again, these units are the units that make up the, the joule. So just wanted to show you a couple of examples of things that you may have seen before with kinetic energy and potential energy of how those units actually make up the joule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the joule here, and I'm going to plug these units in. Okay, So instead of the joule, I'm going to do kilograms times meter squared over second squared. Now remember, Planck's constant was the joule times the second. Okay, So this second is going to cancel out one of these seconds. And then this per second is going to cancel out this per second. One of the meters is going to cancel out this meter. Okay, And we're going to be left with just one meter and the kilogram and the gram. And this is where you realize, oh my gosh, this is where the unit inconsistency lies. When I use this equation, of mass times velocity on the bottom or the denominator, this mass can't be in grams because it's not going to cancel out the kilogram unit in the joule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some conversions. I'm going to change these grams into kilograms by dividing by a thousand. So that's going to put the decimal point right here. And now it's a kilogram. And this kilogram is going to cancel out this kilogram and I'm going to be left with my unit meters. Now, if I take this number and divide by 0 0.045 and divide by 15, I don't get times 10 to the negative 34. I'm sorry, I don't get times 10 to the negative 37. I do get times 10 to the negative 34, and the unit is going to be the meter. Okay, so is this lesson really about using the wavelength equation and telling you that all matter has, you know, particle-like behavior and wave-like behavior? Yes, a little bit, okay? But the true lesson in this unit is understanding that the joule is kilograms times meter squared divided by second squared. And if you're working this out, okay, you need to be able to cancel out those kilograms. So having mass in grams will not work in this equation. So the real part of this lesson is to pay attention to your units Whatever you do with your numbers, you have to do the same thing with your units, and hopefully you get a unit that makes sense in the end. If you don't, it probably means you did the problem wrong. So this example is probably more about dealing with problems with unit inconsistency. Okay, I hope that helped, and if that helps you follow units throughout a problem, please like and subscribe so I can help more students trying to understand chemistry and maybe even a little bit of physics because this happens in physics quite a bit as well.